Hello, bonjour, and welcome to the Don't Waste Water podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Walter, and in today's episode, I'm honored to welcome Mina Sankaran as my guest. Mina is the CEO and founder of Ketos, a company that ambitions to transform how water operators measure, manage, and forecast water quality and efficiency in industrial, agricultural, and municipal applications. How representative of your times and of a sector role model do you have to be to present the Sustainable Development Goal number six at the United Nations? Well, I'm not going to spoil because Mina will tell us in a jiffy. She'll also share how Ketos vertically integrates from hardware to software in a quite unique take at water quality digitization and how that all came from thorough market research. She'll then explain how growing an innovative hardware-based business in the water sector as a woman solo founder is a challenging sum of hurdles, to say the least, and how grit, resilience and passion are the three most essential traits of a successful entrepreneur. In our conversation, we also discuss how digitization is everywhere but in the water industry and how that may be swiftly changing, how water quality and especially heavy metal ions is still a blind spot in many industrial and agricultural applications, how Kitas markets monitoring as a service in a zero money down approach, how growth is a byproduct of solving deep and vivid market pains, and how circular models are the best platform for growth. But also revealing women's inner strength, social entrepreneurship, COVID-19 leapfrogging digitization, and much more. I really enjoyed this deep discussion with Mina, so now it's your turn. Remember, if you like what you're hearing, please share that episode with two of your friends, post it on LinkedIn or even TikTok and tell the world how cool of an inspiration Mina is. Come on, do it and I'll meet you on the other side. You're listening to Don't Waste Water, the podcast that helps water professionals to improve their wastewater treatment, optimize their operation costs and keep up with the latest market trends. This podcast is brought to you by GF Piping Systems. As a leading supplier of piping systems made of plastics and metal, GF Piping Systems is the global expert for the safe and reliable transportation of water, chemicals, and gas. For more information, visit gfps.com. Hi, Mina. Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks, Antoine. Pleasure to be here and grateful for having me here. Well, you know, I have many things to discuss with you today. But we have traditions, so I have to start with the postcard. And uh, what I'm seeing right now from your postcard is is really tempting. You are in Santa Cruz, right? Correct. Nestled in the redwoods right behind me. So I'm lucky that way. (laughs) Thank you. Well, it gets tricky when there's fires, but it's absolutely gorgeous. It looks like gorgeous more than fires right now. I hope that stays that way for that interview, but the interview itself can be fire. That, that's fine with me. Uh, <laughs> when I was reviewing you, your path, I saw many ventures, many things. And usually I don't take notes for that because I can remember everything. For you, that's not the case. I had to take notes because you've really crossed so many paths. You've been working for satellite networks, water monitoring, banking, data centers, refugee support, empowering women. And I was wondering where to start. And I have maybe a hint where to start. I saw that you were presenting the SDG 6 at the United Nations. Is that the right point to start your your story? It's certainly a very interesting culmination of what the UN SDG 6 represented. You know, for me, that was was more of a reward for the entire team of Ketos than individually for me. I think I was representing the team But it was truly a moment where you feel like what you're trying to accomplish, this vision that you're trying to make a movement is coming to fruition and it's getting recognized at a platform, at the right layers of platform where people and leaders around the world know that they have to take the future of water seriously. If our future generations are going to have any glimpse of what it's going to be to have clean, safe drinking water. So I think the UN definitely it symbolizes a certain kind of you know stature in terms of commanding for what the future should hold for and so i think being at that platform was certainly a blessing uh, of years and years of you know sort of different paths coming together 
how did that happen? They just gave you a call and, and there you were? Or? It's very interesting. One of the projects that Kitos did in early 2017 has been a project around smart villages. And part of that project called Smart Village in India was about really helping these villages. We went after 25 villages to take as a subset. And these villages didn't have water for, I think they were getting about once every four days or so. And the idea was, well, that shouldn't be the case. And there is enough technology for us to figure out how to make sure that the, both the quantity and the quality of water is somewhat managed. It's more of a distribution problem than an availability problem. And what was fascinating is I met this woman and in India, when you're villages, there's someone called Sarpanch. It's kind of like the chief of the village. And she, this woman was so fascinating. She had her little moped. She took me on our moped and she started showing me all the different water reservoirs, the tanks and everything. And what she was struggling with is there was no way for her to control the water of how much water she needs to get like distribute around her region. And the second part, she was dealing with water theft. So we were able to implement a solution for her that allowed her to get water every day for even if it's a couple hours, because they could put a limit on it and manage that threshold versus not giving water for a substantial amount of time. And so very simple things like that were implemented across 25 villages. And my philosophy has always been keeping local people involved because I think when companies fail internationally, it's because if you're trying to just go into a community, it's not just technology, it's people, it's culture, it's involvement, and including them to be part of that solution. So we created a circular system where we take the local teenagers and the youth and make them part of the solution so they could manage our system when we leave. And by doing that, they get more enticed to be in the village versus migrate off to cities. And so you're creating multiple impact layers there. And so that circular model that we created from a business standpoint was very attractive to the United Nations. And we got nominated for how can impact projects be created that have not just a commercial and a social impact, but also impact from a future growth And how can alternate business models be created for impacting migration around communities where in a lot of underdeveloped regions, that's becoming a huge issue? It was several fold in terms of how we got pulled into UN and, and World Bank supporting us and others. But it's, you know, several projects like that. And I hope we get, you know, as part of Quito's journey, we get to do a lot more of those. You mentioned impact. I've seen in the various descriptions of yourself, sometimes you mention you're a social entrepreneur. Sometimes you say you're impact-driven, purpose-driven. What's your definition of all these terms? How do you see yourself? I think an entrepreneur is just an entrepreneur. <laughs> I think there's so many ways to add to what that qualifies. I think at the end of it all, it just means you as an individual If you are going to go on this path and journey that is extremely challenging and you're trying to solve a problem, you have to have the grit, you have to have the resilience, you have to have the passion. Because if, without the combination of those three, it doesn't matter how big an idea, you're not going to be able to sustain it. So for me, that grit and that resilience and that passion comes from a place of If you are functioning towards solving a problem, and if you want to make that problem your core mission, that purpose has to be bigger than you, bigger than your team, bigger than your company. And that is what will draw people together. And so to me, the social side of entrepreneurship just means that you're not just addressing a problem that has some commercial value, but it has to have a community impact, it has to have a social impact, it has to have a multidimensional you know, value that not just is a trans single transactional value, but you know, sort of adds several layers post that transaction. And so to me, entrepreneurship is really about what is it in you to take an idea and make it a movement and drive that movement beyond you, beyond the team, beyond the company, because that's when you know it can be successful. It's a very interesting definition because I think that goes quite well along with a shift of paradigm, which was described by, I think it was the dean of the Oxford University. He was explaining that the old model of entrepreneurship was make as much money as you can. 
And nowadays, it's a bit more like finding a problem in the society and, and solving for that problem and being profitable in doing so. But first, solving a problem. Yeah, I mean, think of this, Antoine. Back in the day when our parents and grandparents were working, it was a very different. You work, you come back, and you sort of have a shift and you come back home. Now we all carry this device with us that keeps us 24-7 online. And so even when we're not working, we're at home, we're still sort of working. So if you're spending a massive amount of time in your entire life on the so-called thing job that is defining maximum amount of your time away from any person, wouldn't you want that quality of time to be very definitive of who you are and what you want to contribute or land up doing something that makes you happy? Because if we're working 10 to 12 hours a day and we're not doing anything that makes us happy and lighthearted and enjoying the company of people who are also happy and want to do that, I mean, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So it, it, to me, I'm a big believer that when people told me, and I actually did receive that advice, they said, well, you know, go do a startup, who knows, you might be successful, and then you'll make a lot of money. And then after the day, then go start philanthropy. It's a very typical trajectory that people do, they want to do a startup, they might, and then they think they're going to become financially free to a point that then they'll go and do philanthropy. And my thought process was one in 1000 startups succeed, or maybe one in 100, if the odds have gotten better. But if that chances are so low and you don't know what your outcome is, why would I wait for doing good for a certain part of time where I have no outcome guarantees? And if I can make that difference, doing everything I do is actually serving a purpose. And, and I think that we may not be able to compete with the likes of Amazon and Google and Apple on a salary or a paycheck. But as a team, we are so purpose driven. We are so customer focused about the impact we have for our customers the success we want to create, that's what draws people. That's what keeps our team together. And I think that I don't think I could bring that kind of influence in any other type of, you know, idea or a function that they know is not going to, you know, make a difference for their future. That, that would be really sad. You mentioned the purpose, you mentioned the problems you're solving for the customers. Let's start the deep dive a bit with that. What is actually the problem that Ketos is solving today? We're fundamentally looking at water monitoring. And when I say the reason why we look at water monitoring, take, take a step back. Now, you know, with COVID, everyone's wearing masks and people are very heightened about air quality. And, you know, there's a lot more focus on air quality. Now, if you look at the basics, air, water, food, most of it, we take it for granted. And we land up measuring every aspect of our day, how many steps we walk, what's my heartbeat. Yet, 99% of people have no clue to the quality of water they drink. And it's very easy because we have just been very privileged in our society to not have to think about the water we drink, nor care about how much water we use. And if you ask most people, I've had the lamest answers where I've asked, and it's genuinely the answer is like, where do you think water comes from? They're like, it's coming from a tap. <laughs> it, it's like, well, do you know how many people work so hard to get you that water from that tap 24 seven through the day? And part of it is, you know, this entire sector of water is sort of the last frontier. So you had a wave of the 21st you know, century and all of the technological innovations that are happening in digitization you know, the, these markets hit in banking, you've got the changes happening in the enterprise tech sector, which is farther, farther along, it's always leading the chart, then it comes into power, it comes into transportation, people still regard energy as a much, much higher priority in their mind than water. And so as you plug along, and you come through, water sort of, you know, if you went to if you said, you know, I really want to understand what my water quality is or what my city's water is, or in general, I want to be able to look at data and say, can I prevent a disease outbreak that's water quality driven, right? That amount of possibility doesn't exist today. So you can just go to a website and understand the different aspects of what water quality impact could happen and how could that affect my future health. And so fundamentally, if you start there, like I want to prevent a disease outbreak and you start looking at that's waterborne. Where do I start from? The first thing is 
understanding the different things that could create that water quality impact for that kind of public health hazard. And then you take that layer, you've got all kinds of artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms that are being developed on massive amount of platforms, but they're not being developed as a holistic tool for water quality. So the big gap was you have a lot of software platforms out there that can do AI and ML, and they can bridge the gap between what water industry has with the lack of digital expertise. But fundamentally, we're missing monitoring of heavy metal ions, which is where you had Flint, Michigan. You had a lot of different types of other cities in the similar issue. And you have industrial water that's about 30 to 40 percent coming out with a lot of different types of waste. You've got agriculture water, which is about another 60 percent. And so drinking water is really only 10 percent. So what Quito's fundamentally wants to accomplish is how do we create first the sensors and the hardware to actually detect heavy metal ions in a continuous manner? Because if that existed, I would have just done the platform but then it doesn't exist. So we had to dive in and build the hardware layer in a way that it bridges all the gaps from what we see in the traditional legacy market today, and then be able to take all of that data and create the layer of intelligence, which allows industrial, municipalities, agriculture to now look at water safety, food safety across all their customers in a very different lens. Let me ask you a very candid question here. If I want to develop a software platform, I imagine nowadays I can find software engineers quite everywhere and chances are I can develop that not easily, but certainly I can find people who have that knowledge and build it. On the hardware level, if you ask me tomorrow to start from scratch and develop hardware to test the various parameters you just cited, it sounds like like a moonshot, something really much more difficult. Is that a true impression? And and how did you do that? How did did you really start from scratch? Did did you partner out there with people that that had something pre-existing? Antoine, it's like a lot of people have asked me, Nina, would you do it again? Hardware is so hard, and which is also why investors like run away from hardware if, if possible. You know, it's easier to invest in SaaS startups, easier to measure them as well. But I believe that hardware is transformational. The intelligence that software creates for us to do really impactful stuff that comes from revolutionary hardware. So it has to begin somewhere. And so, from my standpoint. I believe, you know, our bodies are, again, it's another piece of hardware with all of the other neurons and intelligence that exist in our brain. So to me, that combination can be very lethal if used the right way. So the hardware uh, starting point, you know, water is very complex. So first, recognizing that this is a complex problem. Second is if you look at traditional hardware, you have to see what exists and what's not working when you're trying to build something. So when you look at traditional legacy hardware, you have a lot of probes. So you would go take a probe, go to a site, dip it in the water, see how the water you know, color changes. And then you have some data loggers and some people log that data to that, or some people manually are taking that data in a PDF. So there's different forms of how people have traditionally done it. They do pH, turbidity, temperature. There's like the common things. And then you've got in the last seven years, these online analyzers, sort of like a single parameter. Here's my chlorine analyzer. Here's my nitrate analyzer. And What ends up happening on Fauna is like, let's say you're a water operator. We are now expecting you to not only keep ramping up on new technologies, manage these instruments, and now we're expecting you to clean this instrument every couple of days, calibrate it every couple of days. And by the way, if you want to frequently test more, you're going to purchase more consumables. So it's counterintuitive to want to test or encourage more frequent sampling. And then after all of this period, your technology has already gone obsolete because technology is evolving so fast. So if you purchase that equipment and spent a ton of money as an asset by year three, you're already like, well, that's already old news. I can't go just use my chlorine analyzer and go do something with nitrates. It's a very fixed design, right? So my whole philosophy fundamentally was I'm going to look at this as an intersection bringing in the best of minds to bring that together. So chemists, material scientists, physicists are is kind of the core of my R&D team. 
my hardware team is sort of like electromechanical robotic type of engineers. And my software team is cloud architects and data scientists and sort of embedded software firmware leaders. So you have a true blend of a very cross-functional, but very interdisciplinary science meets engineering meets sort of software to bring that analytics that you finally want to deliver to the operator. That's how that has come to fruition. To see now we have a 100% remote controlled robot that can continuously monitor and test 26 or so parameters and can do it in a way that you're able to control it from your mobile phone and manage it based on the frequency that you think is important for your operations makes it very significant because you now have the power to test with no labor consequence and no cost impact, which has never existed before. Think of it as almost like taking principles of software and how you had sort of upgrades remotely, taking a lot of those principles and applying it and almost making the entire infrastructure as a service and delivering water quality data as a service where you as an operator are no longer tied to this new technology thinking, I have to ramp up on anything. You're just looking at the data and thinking, how do I use it? Let me put this aspect of as a service in the fridge for a second. If I get it right, you got the certifications which allow you to, to replace a lab analysis. And developing the hardware in that industry is already a beast. You explained it quite well. But then having the certifications for that is usually another beast, even more difficult to beat, if I might say so. How did you get that? Because that is now not only disruptive on the approach, it's also disruptive saying that instead of going to the lab and making your traditional analysis, which is the way we've done since the 60s, 70s, you can do everything online with the same accuracy. What was your path there? I think the battle here is shifting people's mindset. We're a six-year-old company. We're going to come up on six years in three months. So, and in the water sector, Antoine, I'll tell you this, that I've had companies tell me, large legacy strategic water leaders, one company say, we don't take any company seriously if you've not crossed the five-year mark because we want to see if you would survive. Another person gave to me a seven-year mark and a third one told me 10-year mark. So, yeah. so essentially, it's a lot about building credibility. And so I think that, I'm very, very grateful for the early adopters because they're taking a chance on us. They're foresighted. They're trying to be innovative with their operational systems because that's allowing us to prove the solution, prove the data, and also prove the model, not just technology, but also the business model. And that together is facilitating others to at least have those conversations and for me to plant those seeds because they get intrigued enough that they want to talk about it more. But I would say it's a lot of, lot of nurturing. It does not happen quickly, especially in the municipal sector. Now, in the industrial sector, it's actually quite different. So in the industrial and agricultural sector, they're not looking at us for a compliance perspective. Industrial and agriculture have a lot of value in using equipment like ours to help them with their own process, to remove blind spots, to be able to save massively on their chemical feed, on their treatment, on improving their membrane filtration. So a lot of aspects of their own compliance to be compliant, not necessarily take us as the compliance sample. For municipalities, There are some we, who will jump in to do that versus others who are still sort of, you know, nervous about what am I going to learn? Ignorance is bliss. And so there is a bit of mindset shift. And there's also what procurement allows you to do within municipalities. I'm coming in at a model of there's no purchase. Some procurements are set up to not operate as a, a service model. It's purely purchase, if, especially when it's associated with the hardware. And, you know, they may be set up for Microsoft, What, as a service operations, but if I would go as a service operations and there's a physical piece of that hardware, they don't know how to capitalize on that asset. So I think there's still system-wise some changes that need to happen to encourage municipality adoptions. But I'm hoping that with the water infrastructure bill and the amount of capital being assigned for emerging technologies as well as you know disadvantaged communities and others, 
I'm hopeful that we're able to make a difference to a lot of them in a meaningful way. Regarding your, your business model, was it your plan from day one to go with this zero capex? Because, you know, you disrupt the approach to sensors. You disrupt also the vertical saying you'd go from the sensor to the platform, the software platform. And on top of that, you disrupt the business model. That's, that's much things at the same time. What was your rational with this zero capex? What, what was your intention? Adoption. And also a lot of conversations, Antoine. I had done, as part of my process in 2014, I come from an enterprise tech background. So I have spent a lot of my time in data center world, infrastructure world. So I understand scale, I understand security, I understand sort of like IoT communication, edge device, how do you build software architectures, how do you build large architectures with a blend of hardware, software, like that used to be my world. And so taking all of those concepts and applying for an application like water was a very important problem for me to solve, you know, for several reasons, including a personal journey. So when I was thinking about that, first thing is market validation and talking to customers and really, really defining that pain point. Because what I didn't want to happen is you just build another new cool technology that nobody thinks is a must have. So lots of conversations. And one common thing, this was, it was interesting that I had this validation both from a director of a public utility in both UK as well as in the US. And they were in a, in a they said it together in a, in a panel. They said, technology is obsolete when I keep purchasing it. And I'm not interested in purchasing it because I want to evolve as the technology evolves. My workforce cannot become an expert in every new technology that's coming up. My workforce cannot be expected to learn and become an IT analyst overnight or a data scientist overnight. And I don't have massive amounts of money to constantly go to EPC firms like Acom, Jacobs, and so many others who are going to charge me $25,000, $50,000 for doing integration and software strategy and I'm kind of left 100% dependent without knowing how to put these building blocks together. I want my technology service providers to offer a more holistic view. To me, that was the perfect validation for what we do. And, you know, talking to another very well-known water expert in Singapore, you know, so just speaking with a lot of experts and having a phenomenal advisory ecosystem around me from the very early days to kind of have them as soundboard in prioritizing what we do certainly helped us. And, you know, I want to share what the person in Singapore said. He was like, I land up purchasing so many instruments. I don't even know what I'm doing with them because I've got so many different data streams. Everyone is telling me to take that data stream elsewhere. Everyone else is giving me a new dashboard. Now I have so many of these dashboards, I actually need a consolidated strategy. And that means I have to go spend another 250K with some McKinsey or somebody else who's going to come and tell me what to do. That's because starting from the beginning, people are not thinking about interoperability. People are not thinking about integrated architecture. You can never be a one solution that fixes every problem inside a manufacturing plant, but you have to become that solution that's open to being a glue to a lot of different solutions that brings that together. So it's not about us, it's about the operator. And so if you think of your business model in terms of putting yourself in that person's shoes, what they can and cannot do, and what different procurement and other constraints around their business model allow for you, I think your business model is much more catered to your audience versus defining it for your own commercial growth. Your open aspect is also... Interesting, because you're, you're based not that far from Palo Alto, which is a place where we know people love closed environments, and I'm not criticizing. Um, just to say, it may be counterintuitive. You, you're a startup starting that environment. You, you come up with the, the hardware, with the, the zero capex, and on top of that, you say, now I can integrate everything because I'm open source. If you go to my software platform, you can keep your legacy and try to integrate as much as possible into that stream. How do you build that? Because this market is full of proprietary systems. So it means you have to adapt to the others. They are not going to adapt to you, at least not in the beginning. The idea is not to, you know, our, our hardware is proprietary. Our software platform that we have built is proprietary. But 
I think it's important to allow for easy, flexible integration with REST APIs, with different types of other, you know, sort of layers on top of your platform for the customer to play around with it. Because otherwise, it's very difficult as a customer to sit with six proprietary systems in their environment that don't talk to each other. And I think the drip part of, you know, being data rich, information poor that, you know, that keeps going around in in a lot of the water sector, I think it's because of that legacy approach. And I think the enterprise world is quite used to integrated best of breed type of mentality for decades of adoption. I think that mindset has not seeped into the water sector yet. So people have operated a certain way for 60 years and 50 years. So there's definitely going to be some pushback on that. In this model, the relationship between the customer and the technology service provider shifts because we're taking the risk, we're taking that liability. So it's an ongoing trust, which deepens over time because we're providing you continuous value, continuous improvement of our solution as we gather your feedback. So there is a continuous loop of engagement. And that is a very different approach than a single transaction purchase approach where here's the new device. I'll see you in a few years when I have to come back for service renewal, right? It's a very, very different model. And I think that traditional legacy support structure will shift as we're doing this. And more and more people are going to be thinking about how do I have a massive decentralized network of sensors monitoring all kinds of things. I have a centralized structure of viewing everything and gathering that intelligence to proactively and predictively do something. And how do I democratize that data to make sure everyone can benefit from it? The whole digital smart water, you know, hit its inflation point with like the hype. I think it it sort of crashed a little bit with the hype. And now it's coming a bit more to the realistic curve. And people are, I would say 2017, they were like, yeah, I'm hearing about this trend. In 2019, it was more about, yeah, I've heard that utility does some project around it. I'm curious to see the results. In 2021, post-COVID, with automated remote control being top of mind, operational budgets being top of mind, consolidation being top of mind, that's certainly helping us move the needle forward with digitization far more with the pandemic accelerating, because in 2021, the questions I get are more not the why, but the how. I would have experienced the same, Rolf. It's, there, there was a period of time where people were digitizing for the sake of digitizing because it was cool and hype. And all of a sudden, every everybody discovered this year that it's not only cool, it's useful. And once you've hit that bar, then things change a bit faster. Something interesting in your approach as well is that you enable this shift of paradigm. You already explained it a bit, but if I get you right there, there's a tipping point. If a user is making more than two to four measurements a month, uh, he has reached the balance of cost between what he was doing before and what he's doing now with your system. But that means he can now be testing every day, twice a day, or however he wishes, and be much more granular with his approach to uh, testing. How often do they test today? And from your experience with your early adopters, how did they change their behavior once adopting Keto solutions? To me, one of the most fascinating moments is after we've finished a deployment and we've given, we've done this like knowledge transfer, we've given them their login password and they have all of the platform and everything. It's the excitement of when they're navigating through the platform and they're watching all the data. And it's that expression on the face of, oh, this is cool. I could do this. I could do this. Like simple things that took them three hours to manually do that they're just doing it in their fingertips in a couple of seconds is is very exciting to see. And I think that's the reward for me. An average person would probably do, so we have something called continuous mode. So if you have continuous water stream, you can do a continuous mode. You know, you don't need to know everything all the time. There might be some parameters you need to know once a day. There are some parameters it'd be great to know every 60 seconds. There might be some you want to know every four hours. And that's also another important aspect, Antoine, is that people's hardware are not modularized to accommodate for that. 
every time you need something like that, you have to go and purchase another piece of hardware. So by allowing software and the intelligence to control that, you now have a customer who's able to do certain amount of testing that they do every 60 seconds. So I would say by default, every single one of our customers has continuous mode on and they all have like about six or seven parameters they get every 60 seconds. So like pH, conductivity, salinity, DO, TDS, temperature, and so forth. And then they do like, hey, I'm curious about iron at 6 a.m. in the morning. I want to know nitrates at about 10 a.m. Maybe at 4 p.m. Let's do arsenic manganese and just kind of see how that's going. So it's exciting to watch them play with it and experiment with it because they don't have to think, is this going to cost me? That's very refreshing and liberating for the operator. So I don't remember if I go to a platform, we have a savings tab where we actually show them if you did the same amount of tests with the lab, here's how much this would have costed you. And it's an interesting one for them to seem like, oh, I would have never done that. And so it's fascinating in that regard because the cost per data point lands up being somewhere around 0.01 cent to $2.14, depending on the variation of your testing. And that's where the power is, because if you're able to test and collect more data, collect more qualitative, relevant data, and you actually are able to make a difference in how those data pieces make a difference. I was curious to know if you already had the chance to make an analysis of how much an operator is saving through this increased level of information. So we do something called like an ROI calculator playing around with, you know, potentially how you've used your lab stuff. I don't think it is a complete replacement of lab because there's still so much to test in water. So you've got, you know, different types of bacterial things. We don't do bacterial today. I would say that it's more about thinking, what are the types of issues that you would send someone to collect a sample, prep the water, and, you know, manage your current equipment and All of those pieces can be fully replaced and you can repurpose your analyst to not be driving around, but to actually do relevant work that he would care more about. So it's almost repurposing of workforce in a way that you're helping the plant be sustainable and scalable. Let me come back to what you said earlier about the fact that now the risk is a bit more with you. You have quite a unique level of financing in this industry. You, you closed a Series B last year for $18 million, of dollars, which absolutely makes sense with your, your business model of being this zero capex. You need to be investing yourself uh, at the beginning to, to start the flywheel. That is something which is not common, but, but often seen in other industries, but absolutely uncommon in the, in the water industry. What's your intended path for growth? I think the important piece there is, you know, most entrepreneurs who are coming into the water sector are kind of shy about how they carve the company's projected growth because investors are traditionally very risk averse in this sector. So I've, I've landed up building a very cognitively diverse community of investors who are from clean tech to tech to impact and a combination of all kinds of uh, investment communities from the single approach of us leading the market in this disruption that we are we're doing. And so there's pros and cons to being the market leader in that space. Because you have the first mover advantage, time is on your side. But because you're the first mover advantage, you also are the one breaking all the barriers for others to follow. So like there's always pros and cons and, and trade-offs there. I'm hopeful that investment communities will be more mindful of how water startups really deserve to get better valuations as well as get better funding to survive. Because first off, the fact that an entrepreneur is jumping in and trying to do something anything in water is hard. So the fact that they're jumping in to do something in the water sector should be really applauded and, you know, really supported and nurtured and encouraged. And I don't think it's done as much as it should. And I'm talking very relatively to the enterprise and, and other sectors. And 
you don't even see this, even a comparable level of funding that goes into ag tech for water tech. So it's kind of like if you start putting a list of the least funded type of category, water is probably right there at the bottom, yet it is the most important thing for our entire community from a survival standpoint. So I hope that as ESGs and everyone is all talking a lot about different types of capital, people walk the talk and they actually put the money where their mouth is in terms of the conversations. And so, you know, our focus is clear, increase customer value, rapidly keep increasing market adoption. We've got some clear winners in the industrial agriculture and municipal sector in agriculture, we're hitting both. We're able to get really good support from both open field ag as well as indoor ag, like protected ag with greenhouses, vertical farms. So, you know, we're here to stay. We're here to really make a difference in what we provide to customers as value. And we're very keen on customer feedback because we're continuously improving. And we can only hope that investors recognize that because we can't be competing against a food delivery app. The other thing is that you are starting with an unfair disadvantage in that field. I was discussing with uh, with uh, Oriana Bretschger on, on that microphone, and she actually advised me to discuss with you. So I'm very glad she gave me that, that advice. And um, in her interview, she mentioned that 1% of the venture capital money goes to female-led businesses. So you have kind of a double issue here. The water sector is not the one which is funded the most, like you said. And even within this, this sector, if it's a, a woman-led st- startup, you, 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 you face another handicap. It's, it's a terrible way to say it, terrible way to say it. But is it something you experience yourself? Yeah, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Oriana and I have <laughs> talked about this briefly. And I would say that we both have hit multiple tiers. There's only one thing that I would say Oriana has slightly better luck, but we both went into the water sector. So there's your first ding. And then the second is we both get classified in that women entrepreneur thing. But third is we both are building hardware. And so again, we get another ding. And when I say hardware, as in She's really building something very innovative as well. It's not like the types of hardware that you hear about where I've taken two sensors from commercial off the shelf and packaged it up and selling it as a B2C product in a, in a you know, house. Like that's very different than the, the complexity of what she's building and what we're building. So the hardware lands up being a third ding. And the fourth is I got ding additionally saying you're a solo founder and you don't have a sort of a co-founder. Um, and Oriana has a co-founder. So I have landed up getting sort of multiple dings. But, you know, I, I think every time someone brought up five reasons why I shouldn't do something or why they would tell me a no, uh, I've even been asked by an investor, what if you got hit by a truck because you're a solo founder? To me, I'm even more driven to do the right thing and find the right partners who are supportive of the Quito's ecosystem and to drive the mission forward. There's one element from your path that I'd like to take here. And then I'd like to come back to Quito's to close this deep dive. You are working with uh, the woman's inner strength, the wins. Can you just explain us in a couple of words what, what you're doing there and what you try to achieve? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Looks like you really dug up. So, you know, one thing that I realized very early on as I was pro- progressing through my career, uh, being an electrical engineer, being an electronics communications engineer, most of these classes, I, it was like two women in a class of 100. And along my career, again, infrastructure, network engineer, all of these roles, it was like one or two women in, a, in an entire organization. And I landed up being mentors to a lot of different girls, women, different uh, startups, supporting. And so I thought to myself, there is very specific patterns in how women share performance to how men share performance. And I think just, just general characteristics and so forth. So I wanted to let women feel more empowered that they can control their own destiny of how they feel happy regardless of the outcome and 
how they can leverage their inner strengths to truly achieve the potential that they are capable of. And there's nobody stopping them besides they themselves. And don't take no for an answer. So in order to kind of encapsulate that all of those <laughs> thoughts together, I started something called WINS, which is Women's Inner Strength. There's no membership fee or anything. It's just a group. Uh, it's like a lean-in group that we meet uh, once in a couple months. We've had some you know, rough breaks during COVID, but the net net has been really be that support system for women of all backgrounds, all different types of career, because you always land up seeing women in engineering, women in law, where people start thinking that your career defines who you are, but that's not the case. I want to encourage even the housewives to come in because that's a very, very hard job. And I have even more respect now that I have a seven month hold for what that means. And so it's really about dropping judgment and bringing women together, regardless of the type of career you have and building that strong support mentor network to uplift every single person and make them feel they're not alone. And second, that they can achieve anything that they put their mind to or they want to. I made myself the promise to, to stop asking this kind of question to, to every woman I had on, on that microphone, but I, I can't help. Uh, <laughs> it's just that, you know, I know that you, you alluded to that in your interview with uh, with Dave McKipsey on, on his own podcast uh, on this silver wave. And um, even if you think of it as a sector, when we don't invite the woman at the same table, we are just leaving half of the of the talents it's just shooting in your own food so uh, it's it's a nonsense and i'm a son of a feminist and i have two daughters and to me uh, i think it's an important thing with which we should all be looking at that i mean I, i've been working with so many brilliant women and at certain levels in the hierarchy at certain um, decisions first they just disappear and and that's a nonsense so didn't want to push you in a corner there, but um, I was impressed by that in, in, in your in your past. So I, I thought that that was worth mentioning. Oh, thanks for asking. To come back to to Kitos and to close our deep dive, where are you in six years? You know, in six years, I hope Kitos is no longer having to worry about awareness to start start with. People actually understand that there is a solution to solve this problem. Second. People are able to look at their phone and dro when they're dropping their kid off to school, know that their school is monitoring their water quality and their kid is drinking safe water and know that in the area and by and punching in a zip cord and the live neighborhood that they're living, they understand what that water safety looks like for them so that communities feel the control and the power back in their hands and the ability for utilities to also be respected and appreciated by its own constituents knowing how hard they operate. So I hope that all the cities and utilities realize we're here to help them. I hope that industrials realize we're here to help transform their businesses to sustainable operations. And ultimately, the data across the globe becomes so massive that we're able to potentially predict a disease outbreak if not prevented. It's very interesting because everything is value and purpose driven. You didn't tell me that you're going to triple your business or you're going to go through the roof. It's like you, you're bringing a value and then your success is going to come with that value. Exactly. And I think that's the, it, it kind of comes back to your first question of what is social entrepreneurship. And I think this, the entire thing ties together is that when you are successful in creating value, the money will come. And I think if you put the focus on value creation and problem solving, the other parts fall in place. That's a perfect conclusion. Mina, if it's fun with you, I propose you to switch to the rapid fire questions. Oh, go for it. I'm, I'm excited about this rapid fire. <laughs> it's time for the rapid fire questions. The principle is uh, I come with a list of questions. I try to keep my questions short and you try to keep your answers short. And I'm usually always the one which, which is sidetracking the, the conversation. So uh, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> First question, what is the most exciting project you've been working on and why? Oh, um, a project in Israel, in West Bank, where we're going to make, I believe, a huge difference in a community for uh, their olive irrigation, where they absolutely have no water. So lots of interesting things going on, but that's a, an exciting one as we are embarking on lots of international projects. What's your favorite part of your current job? When I'm actually at a customer site uh, and we are finishing an installation, finishing a deployment and sort of, you know, seeing the customer react to the value of what we've just done and them seeing that data for themselves, that expression for the first time from a water expert who has done something a certain way for 30 years is priceless. You mentioned right before this project in, in Israel, how international are you today with Kitas? In the past, we've deployed in India and Mexico and US. Uh, we're now deploying actively in Brazil, in Israel. We have several projects underway in Peru, Chile, Mexico. So quite a bit in LATAM and essentially growing in Australia and UK as well later part of the year. What is the trend to watch out in the water industry? I would say the latest trend would be integrate all your digital assets to create value for yourself. That's a precise trend because I, I've had digitization as a trend, you know, so um, yeah. <laughs> your, yours is much more precise. <laughs> what is the thing you care about the most when you're working on a new project? And what is the one you care the least? Um, the least? I'll go with the least. Uh, the paperwork in procurement is probably, if I can, um, if there is a procurement facilitating company, That would be fantastic to work with, um, which may be a, a, something a startup can actually work on for all other companies. So that's probably the least. Um, the best part is, you know, like I alluded to before, is understanding, um, you know, and seeing the impact of what you create for a customer. But also more exciting is kind of looking at the horizon of how, I, how we can be a trusted advisor for other customers who are getting started on this journey. You know, how can we be that beacon of light for them in, in a truly unconditional manner for them to succeed? Do you have sources to recommend to keep up with the water and wastewater market trends? Hmm. Um, there's, there's a lot of different types of sources. I mean, I do a lot of different type of news feed, but Water Online is an interesting one. Everybody, I think, uses them. There's also Global H2 News I've been tapping on recently. But yeah, there's, there's tons of water feeds uh, that you can read about. But I tried to read a little bit more global and not just U.S. because it gives you very different perspectives of, you know, U.S. is still far behind in terms of the amount of investment and focus they put on water compared to several other countries in the world. And finally, last question, would you have someone to recommend me to, to get on that same microphone like you today? Oh, hmm. Have you had Melissa Meeker? Nope. Yes, there you go. And, and, and a fireball of a woman. She runs a water tower. She would, uh, you know, she can come at it from a very different perspective. She's doing as a non sort of a technology company owner like Oriana or me, but uh, more from a lens of somebody who's seeing a lot of water companies and, and working with a lot of utilities as well as others. And she's fantastic. So you will definitely enjoy speaking with her. So I hope that works out. Fantastic. If people want to follow up with you, where shall I redirect them? Where are you the most active? I would say I'm very active on LinkedIn. So that would be great. Uh, website, I think everybody's aware, www.ketos.co. Um, for additional information, just email us, info at ketos.co. And we'd be happy to share anything that we can add value to you. I'll put the, the links in the, in the episode description because I found out that there's another Ketos which is doing foilers. So <laughs> <laughs> just to... well, at, least, at least we're not a keto diet because we do get that too. So True. <laughs> well, Mina, it was a pleasure. Um, I'd be very, very happy to have you again in six years to check uh, if your prediction uh, happened to be true. And uh, yeah, All the best in that endeavor. Thank you, Antoine. Absolutely a pleasure being here as well. And truly, again, thank you for thinking of me. And, and I guess thanks to Ariana for recommending me as well. 
Thanks for listening to Don't Waste Water. This podcast was brought to you by GF Piping Systems. Loved this episode? Head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. See you next time. Yeah, 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 yeah.